devoting yourself to a single pursuit for years and decades will teach you a lot of lessons. In my case, writing has helped me in innumerable ways. Of course, I'm a far better storyteller than I was at 13, but the sum of my experiences has also made me a much better person. I didn't say a good person, I said a much better person. I had a wonderful AP English teacher in high school. As I understand it, Mrs. Iodice was a college English professor, but decided she wanted to get at students when they were younger, when she could have a bigger influence on them. That certainly worked in my case. We read something like a book a week. It was great. If I remember correctly, we read Their Eyes Were Watching God, Brave New World, There Was Probably an Austin in There Somewhere, and Jane Eyre. Ugh. Jane Eyre. As a dumb 17-year-old, I was bored to tears by the book. As a guy who had zero luck with the ladies, I was annoyed that Jane didn't come around until that Rochester guy was all burned up and disfigured in the fire. I was annoyed that Rochester tried to do the right thing and get over everything to give himself to Jane, but she didn't care. I know, I know. Like I said, my thoughts about the book were unfair. I don't feel bad. It was a long time ago. Sometime after I read the most boring book ever, I finally reached the level of maturity necessary to understand that I was looking at Jane Eyre in the wrong way. Hating and ignoring the book did me no favors. I gained nothing from simply dismissing Charlotte Bronte's work. I realized that I didn't have to like the book. That doesn't matter. What does matter is that the book has held a respected place in English literature for more than 150 years. I do myself a disservice if I don't at least try to figure out why. Which brings me to the subject of today's video. A couple weeks ago, I finally discovered Alexa Dunn's YouTube channel. Link in the description if you are unfamiliar with her. I was first struck by her joy and enthusiasm. As far as I can tell, she is extremely positive and simply wants to share happiness and her experiences with the rest of the writing community. This, I thought, is a writer who deserves to be featured in a writing craft video. I'm going to take a look at Alexa Dunn's debut novel, Brightly Burning. But first, a word from our sponsor, Intertextuality. You want your work in progress to interact with an established text? Well, you need to establish an intertextual relationship with another author. Whether your work builds on similarities or differences with the other piece, forcing multiple works to play together can add depth and nudge the reader into thinking about both works in a new way. Ever see the film Gravity? Or Castaway? Or Apollo 13? These are all stories about a protagonist, or three, who are far away from home. They face near insurmountable problems, one after the other. Just when it seems that the situation is stable, boom, something else goes wrong. As they say, there are no new stories. Homer's The Odyssey is about a guy who just wants to get home, but there's one problem after the other. Isn't that interesting? One of humanity's oldest surviving stories is still relevant as men and women journey to the stars. Intertextuality. My first thousand fans can get 20% off with the promo code Allison. That's A-L-L-I-S-O-N. Before you know it, Intertextuality will help you create timeless works that are still yours. And we're back. Published in 2018, Brightly Burning is a young adult sci-fi reimagining of Jane Eyre. See, I wasn't talking about the Bronte book for nothing. I had the most wonderful reading experience with this book. I ordered a copy from my local indie. The whole global pandemic thing has had me down. Why? I can't go to a coffee shop and read for hours watching people swirl around me. Instead, I got a cup of coffee and locked myself in my office all alone. And I read. No distractions, no stress, just reading. Fortunately for me, I liked Brightly Burning a ton. The protagonist is a young woman named Stella Ainsley. Yes, Stella for star. She's a teacher and engineer on a spaceship that is breaking down. Earth has been frozen for centuries. There are rumors that the planet is inhabitable, but no one knows for sure. What Stella does know is that her ship, the Stalwart, is a rust bucket that will soon no longer be spaceworthy. She lucks into a position on a new ship, the Rochester. Get it? That's, that's from Jane Eyre! And she meets the enigmatic and handsome Captain Hugo, a rich orphan from a prominent family. I won't ruin too much of the story. And besides, this isn't a review. This is a writing craft video. What can we learn from Alexa Dunn's book? Like I said in my introduction, I didn't like Jane Eyre. But that doesn't matter. And bear with me, it's been quite some time since I read Jane Eyre. Like Jane, Stella is a strong and independent woman who chafes at her circumstances. Both characters are kept down by those different circumstances. Society, technology, class, both characters are behind the eight ball. Both of them end up with the man they love, but only after those men endure extreme trials. That's the first point I want to make. When you write a retelling of a classic story, or you feature a heavy and obvious influence from a classic work, you're working with suspense in a different way. 
in a completely original story, to the extent that a story can be original, the reader has no hint as to what might happen, aside from what you have told them. Brightly Burning and other works have a different relationship with suspense. I remembered Mr. Rochester getting all burned up in the fire. I knew something like that would happen in Brightly Burning. Uh, I definitely remembered the crazy wife locked up in the attic. I knew that idea would come up at some point. I remember Jane shuttled from place to place. Stella is literally shuttled from place to place by Sergei, a fun shuttle pilot. Miss Dunn clearly knew that she had a special set of expectations and responsibilities. By very loosely adapting a classic work, she knew that she lost the element of complete surprise. She also knew that she had the obligation to hew closely enough to Jane Eyre to satisfy fans of that book, while also keeping her story fresh enough to satisfy a storyteller's ultimate responsibility. It simply wouldn't do to copy Charlotte Bronte beat for beat, so Miss Dunn didn't. I think that one of the biggest reasons that she was so successful was because she was able to build Stella's world so completely. We start out on the Stalwart, where Stella has two jobs and lots of friends. She also has sweet relationships with her students. While the reader meets Jane at the age of 10, Stella is nearly 18, and her life has forced her to become a grown-up by that age. Mostly, anyway. Stella appropriately retains some of the markers of youth. What's the lesson here? Steal from other writers and works, but make it your own. Let's talk about structure. I love talking about structure. One of my MFA professors, the brilliant Aaron McGraw, encouraged us to think a little more mathematically about our work than we otherwise would. I gave Brightly Burning the full grad school reading treatment. Uh, fountain pen in hand, I made notes, circled phrases, left check marks beside particularly graceful turns of phrase, and I kept track of the length of each chapter. Here's my list. Okay, I know, I know, you can't read that very clearly. That's fine. I popped the numbers into Excel. Okay, there we go. Looking at the numbers, the first thing I noticed is that Ms. Dunn adopted the same idea that I've generally used in my own uh, young adult novels. Each chapter averages out at about 11.9 uh, pages. Uh, I've never counted my own, I guess, but I generally try to go for 10. I find this a productive number for a couple of reasons. YA novels are targeted primarily at YAs, so it's probably a good idea to keep the chapters on the short side, attention spans and all that. I also like the way that the shorter chapters built from shorter sections maintains the narrative momentum. There's always something happening, and if a section is flagging, guess what? It's going to be over in a few pages anyway. No big deal. Of course, there are instances in which an author must stretch his or her wings a little. Some of those chapters clock in at 17, 18 pages. Why? These are important chapters in which a lot is happening. Chapter 6 finds Stella growing accustomed to life on the Rochester, a far better ship than the one to which she is accustomed. Chapter 20 has a lot going on. There's stuff with the Jane Eyre required aunt. Uh, Stella reunites with an old friend. She deals with her cousin. Lots of stuff. The point is that we must make full use of the page space we occupy. The more that is happening, the more words you're allowed. The chapter lengths also lend the book a pleasant texture. Check out this chart uh, of each chapter length. See that jagged line? Ms. Dunn keeps the reader interested by alternating chapter lengths. I'm sure that this wasn't a completely conscious decision, but alternating long and short keeps the reader on the edge of his or her seat. It's also significant that the epilogue is only five pages long, the shortest chapter by far. I like that choice, too. The story between Stella and Hugo was resolved in the previous chapter. I don't want to spend 20 pages learning about the aftermath. I just want a little tiny glimpse into the protagonist's new normal once all is said and done. Another example is the prologue at the end of the final Harry Potter book. I don't have a copy on me, uh, but it's only a few pages as I recall. So after a decade of reading and thousands of pages, you just get a little taste of the future. This allows you to fill in the gaps for yourself as you reflect upon the story. I know basically what Stella and Hugo's life together will be like, but in the weeks since I finished the book, I've had plenty of pleasant moments filling in the blanks with my own ideas. Another thing that I like about the structure of Brightly Breathing is the way Ms. Dunn handles the dramatic present between chapters. I guess I've never done a study of such things, but most of the time, a chapter break is an opportunity to zip through time and space in a graceful manner. After all, there's empty space, a great big number on the next page. Ms. Dunn uses some of the chapter breaks in the novel to ratchet up the suspense in the dramatic present. For example, at the end of chapter 21, Stella and Hugo finally kiss. Yeah, there we go. Then there's a half a page of white space. You turn the page, your blood pressure is a little bit higher, your pulse races from the sweetness of the kiss. Okay, it's the beginning of chapter 22. Ooh, and Stella is telling us all about the aftermath of the kiss and what happened next. They kiss more, and more heavily. Oh, to be young again. 
In this way, the chapter break is not so much a narrative break as it is a tease. The reader must pause, must literally reflect on the events. He or she must move their hands and eyes before finding out what happens next. The lesson? Chapter and section breaks can boost the suspense. These are tools. They can help you zip through time and space, or they can keep your reader on tenterhooks as you extend a scene. Even though Brightly Burning is obviously set in the future, there are some elements that feel classic or, or feel drawn from the past. Chapter 18 features something as quaint as a poker game between the primary characters. I suppose it's common to use a poker game as a device. It makes sense. There's dissembling and bluffing. The stakes are literal. There are literally stakes during each hand, both in terms of money and in terms of the subtext of the scene. I don't want to ruin the story, so you'll have to pick up the book if you want to know what each character pushes into the middle of the table. Like I said, I enjoyed the quaintness of the poker game as well. I don't recall if the characters in Jane Eyre played cards, but in 2020, going into 2021, I love the old-fashionedness of people sitting around a table and playing cards, not with apps, not via Zoom or something, with real cards together in a room. We should bear in mind, whether or not we're writing science fiction, that some things are timeless, or should be. Playing cards with friends, reading a book made out of paper, listening to live music. The same principle was mentioned by Professor Harry S. Plinkett in his review of Star Trek Nemesis. Why does the drummer need to play space symbols? Why does Captain Picard have to page through a space photo album? Most things change, but some things can remain the same. Alexa Dunn is currently one of my favorite literary citizens. Haha, <laughs> uh, again, I could be missing something, but we should all aspire to be so positive and focused on craft. That's one of my problems. I get depressed about negative people and influences. Please check out her website, link in the description. Check out Brightly Burning, link in the description. She's quite excited about her forthcoming YA thriller called The Ivies, so keep an eye out for that one. Who do you think is a great literary citizen? Have you ever written a reimagining of a classic work? Do you hate me because I just couldn't get into Jane Eyre? Let me know in the comments. Okay, look, you know I have to do this. Like this video. Please click subscribe so you won't miss any of my writing craft videos. Check out my own books. Until next time, this is Kenneth Nichols also known as Allison Rhodes, reminding you, books are good.